In the wake of Sinbad the Sailor, legendary hero of the tales of a thousand and one nights, the Arab navigators were the uncontested masters of the Indian Ocean during the entire Middle Ages. Following the rhythm of the monsoon winds in their dhows, they reached the shores of Indonesia, and in particular, the Moluccas, the famous Spice Islands. Their holds laden with clove, nutmeg, pepper, ginger, and cardamom, they would then make their way back to the Arabian Peninsula, where Venetian merchants were waiting to buy their cargo worth its weight in gold. At the beginning of the 16th century, Vasco da Gama, guided by an Arab navigator, opened the Indian Ocean to the Portuguese caravels. But it eventually was the Dutch who one century later seized control of Indonesia and the spice route. To navigate in the heart of Indonesia, with its 17,500 islands, the world's largest archipelago, the islanders designed sturdy boats like the Pinisi, a native schooner that originated in Sulawesi. Originally used to transport cargo, our Pinisi, the Ombak Puti, the White Wave, is now a cruise boat. Along with a few other passengers, we're on board and heading for the island of Flores on a discovery voyage in the Lesser Sunda Islands. In the hollow of this valley, surrounded by volcanoes, the inhabitants have fashioned a stunning landscape, a world of terraced rice fields, a watery staircase sculpted into the mountainside. In the image of the rest of Indonesia, Flores is a land of rice, here, sophisticated irrigation techniques allow the farmers to get up to four harvests a year. The Mangarai territory in western Flores is the realm of the Linkos, the striking spiderweb rice fields. Following the road that crosses the rice fields, we arrive at the little village of Melo, just in time for a ritual celebration. Ancestor worship is very important for the Mangarai. The Chachi dance, a ritual combat between men of different villages, is a trial of strength and courage. But even more, it is a way of honoring the ancestors, as the Kepaladesa, the village headman, explains. The traditional dance called Chachi that we practice in the Mongarai province is not a war dance. There's no winner, no loser. It's a dance performed as an expression of our thanks and our respect towards our ancestors. It can last three days. The chief of the village wears a red turban on his head. The Chachi combatants are dressed in almost the same way, except that they are bare chested. The Chachis wear a leather headpiece symbolizing the buffalo. 
and they wear a bamboo shoot as a tail. Each one has a shield to defend himself, the toda, and a bamboo whip, the wado. The combatants take turns playing the roles of warrior and buffalo. The warrior can strike anywhere with his whip, but he's allowed only one blow. The festival continues to the throbbing rhythm of the gamelan orchestra and the bamboo dance. We come into Ruteng, the capital of the Mangarai region. Even though the lesser Sunda Islands have been under the influence of the Indianized kingdom since the 5th century, they, unlike Sumatra, Java, and Bali, are relatively untouched by Hinduism and Buddhism. On the other hand, the commercial expansion of the Arabs in the 15th century brought Islam to the entire archipelago except to some islands like the Moluccas, where it was countered by the arrival of the Portuguese. They came to the island of Flores, where they set up a trading post and built a fortress. Dominican priests converted the population. In 1599, the island numbered 100,000 Catholics. <laughs> We belong to the Congregation of the Sisters of the Virgin Mary. It's the same order as that of Holy Mary of Mourning. As to the religious life of Mangarai, there's a harmonious atmosphere, and they are very fervent believers. In Flores, it's possible to get a religious education. In general, most everyone is Catholic, except for a number of inhabitants who are Muslim. Five percent of Flores' population is baptized, which doesn't keep them from respecting certain animist beliefs, in particular, ancestor worship. The wooden cargo boats that have always done the runs between the islands and the coastal towns unload their goods on the docks of Labuan Bajo. For some time now, they've been sharing the channel with the tourist boats, and in particular, the dive boats visiting the coral reefs. From the deck of our Pinisi, the Ombak Puti, we watch as the docks of Labuan Bajo recede into the distance. The 
captain has set his course west for the little island of Rinka. sail along the coast of Flores for a few hours. In the late afternoon, the captain decides to drop anchor. Here, just off a little fishing village, is where we will spend the first night of our cruise. Rinka. The island of Rinca is part of the Komodo National Park, founded in 1980.
Walking around the island, one can see a variety of animals, like monkeys and buffalo. And since Rinka has far fewer visitors than the neighboring island, Komodo, it's possible to observe here in their natural habitat the famous Komodo dragons. It's thought that the Komodo dragon appeared in Indonesia around four million years ago. Its range originally occupied a vast continental territory. But when the seas rose around five or 6,000 years ago, creating the lesser Sunda Islands, this huge lizard became isolated on these islands, which make up its present day habitat. Komodo, mereka hidup di the dragons of Komodo, like this one here, live in the tropical forest and in desert-like regions. They usually hunt in the morning or at the end of the day. During the rest of the day, they sleep, they rest, they're completely inactive. In fact, they don't like the heat and they never stay out in the sun. It's not good for them. They prefer more mild temperatures, like what we're having today. They have a very keen sense of smell that allows them to smell prey at a distance of five kilometers. So they use their sense of smell to hunt big animals like the buffalo. When they bite the buffalo, the buffalo runs off. But after three or four weeks, the buffalo eventually dies from the infection caused by the bite. Once it's dead, the Komodo dragons always manage to find it, thanks to their sense of smell, and then they eat it. The difference between the males and the females is mainly a question of size. The males are much larger, and their head is much bigger than the females. The males can easily measure over 3 meters, 3 meters 20. The females are much smaller. They're rarely more than two meters long. When we get back on board, the crew of the Ombak Puti is already in the middle of a maneuver, hoisting the sails. Our sails filled with wind, we head for the next island, Komodo. While the passengers enjoy lunch on the deck, we go to have a chat with Captain Abdi up in the bridge. In 1974, after I got my high school diploma, I moved to Jakarta. The very next year, I was working at sea. The boat belonged to my parents. We were traders. All year long, we'd be doing runs between Jakarta and Tanjung Padang, Jakarta and Palembang, or Jakarta and Jambi. 
But back then, we just used the sails. The boat had no motor. It's hard to navigate in the Komodo region. Because of the narrow channels between the islands, the current is very strong. It's always been a very difficult spot to navigate. I prefer the Flores Sea, the Java Sea, and the Straits of Barala. You're out in the open water, it's easier. And I also really like sailing in the Strait of Makassar. Reassured by Captain Abdi's years of experience, we enjoy the stunning landscapes as our schooner slips pleasantly past the islands and the reefs on our way to Komodo. Join the other passengers in a launch for Kampung Komodo, the island's main village. A number of times since leaving Flores, we've noticed these rather surprising boats with their delicate dragonfly wings. The stopover in Kampung Komodo may give us a chance to find out more about them. The houses in this village are built on stilts, as in the rest of the country a wise precaution against tsunamis, rain, and reptiles. The ever-increasing number of tourists coming to see the Komodo dragons has brought out a certain natural talent for sculpture in some of the local fishermen. Back to the beach. We're going to meet up with Andy, a fisherman who has offered to take us out on his boat. Now, we'll finally get the whole story about these strange craft. During the season, which is in April and May, and even June, we go fishing every day and we can bring back up to 20 to 30 kilos of fish in a single night because we go out around 6 in the evening and come back around 5 the next morning. Right now we go out only every three or four days. Fuel is expensive, you know. We can't afford to go out every day. The nets are hung all around the boat on these wings extending off either side of the hull. To manipulate the net, the fishermen move about balancing on wooden slats like tightrope walkers. Memang ini 
alat begini dulu we didn't fish this way before orang begini di bicara begini menangkap ikan it was the fishermen of the Sulawesi Islands the boogies who developed this fishing technique logika itu orang bogis punya cara jadi terbius semua pada then everybody copied them the sorong of Papua the fishermen of Kupang of Nusa Tenggara they all use this technique soalnya mudah sekali untuk it's much easier to haul in the nets with a boat like this one. Before it needed a lot more effort. Thanks to the boogies, fishing has become much easier. We leave Komodo Island and pursue our route west toward the island of Sumbawa. Since the beginning of our trip, we've sighted a good number of PDCs. The boats continue to ship goods from island to island, as in the past. They have a stunning line, and one can easily understand how Dick came up with the idea of using them as cruise boats. I fell in love with these boats in Indonesia when I was uh, backpacking way back in the 70s and um, following the trail in those days from Bali all the way to Jakarta. So Pinisis, the kind of boat we are on right now, uh, have been used since ages, maybe since 70th century, for inter-island traffic, bringing cargo from one place to another, uh, food, uh, furniture, whatever, and they're a mix, uh, in terms of construction, a mix of Chinese junks, uh, in European galleons from the 17th century, and uh, they're very practical. Most important feature maybe is that they uh, have a low draft, so they can get very close to the islands, because there's so many reefs in Indonesia and the archipelago, and uh, the original Pinisis have seven sails. You can see that also with this boat. It's very typical, seven sails. That is three jibs, two mainsails, and two topsails. With these boats, we go to the Moluccas, we go to, to plenty of the 17,000 islands in Indonesia. And the people will understand that very well. We use their boats, we approach their islands, and we are most welcome to meet them in their own way. We continue our journey in the direction of Sumbawa and Bima, our next port of call. Captain Abdi has been sailing these waters for so long, he knows every cove and inlet along the coast. The day draws to a close, and we drop anchor in the middle of one of Sumbawa's most stunning bays. A turquoise gem surrounded by tawny bronze mountains. In the morning,
morning, we're approaching Bima, Sumbawa's most active port. The number of Pinisis lined up along the pier show just how important these boats still are to the local economy. We've seen the very Catholic Flores. Now we'll visit the very Muslim Sumbawa. At the beginning of the 17th century, the Makassar sultans of Sulawesi, who controlled the spice route, converted to Islam. As they ruled over all the lesser Sunda islands, they imposed this new religion on Sumbawa definitively. This palace, the residence of Bima's rulers until independence in 1949, is now a little museum that houses some of the objects belonging to the former sultans. Whether it be Catholicism in Flores or Islam in Sumbawa, the great religions have not succeeded in eliminating the ancestral animistic practices. Even though the origin and meaning may have been lost, the inhabitants of the little village of Wawo are still quite attached to their traditions. The confrontation of man against man is always the high point of these tribal rituals. But in Wawo, it assumes a rather singular form. This tradition, called Arupala, head bumping in English, consists in dueling with your head. It began a very long time ago with our ancestors who lived in the region of Babon. It's a form of combat. Indonesians like to challenge each other. Machete against machete, spear against spear. But the real combat is man against man. That's how the idea of head-to-head -head combat came about. Here, they call it Adupala.
Not everyone has the courage to do combat with their head. When we challenged the neighboring villagers to head bumping, they took to their heels. As of yet, we're the only ones to practice this type of combat. We leave Bima and continue our route along the north coast of Sumbawa. soon be coming into Satonda, our next port of call. The mountain we see outlined on the horizon looks fairly inoffensive, and yet it is Tambora, a volcano whose historic eruption in 1815 is considered the largest in history. With 500 volcanoes, Indonesia is the most volcanically active zone on Earth. But the demons that inhabit the depths of the Earth seem to be slumbering, and the captain once again can drop anchor along this idyllic shore. Along with some other passengers, we get up early to enjoy the first rays of dawn striking Satonda. No one dares speak for fear of breaking the spell of the moment. Later in the morning, we disembark to discover this island. According to legend, the lake in the center is sacred. Many years ago, maybe before Islam came to Indonesia, uh, animistic inhabitants of the islands here, or Hinduistic people. For them, uh, Satonda was a sacred uh, place. People could come to Satonda Island and they uh, would do a certain ceremony and then they would hang a stone uh, in the trees around the lake and uh, have their wish come out. So maybe with a woman who couldn't get pregnant or an illness in the family, Then there are different stories. And one story is if uh, your wish would have come out, then you should come back to the island and do another ceremony with a little blood offer. So maybe you uh, bring a chicken and you offer it to the gods here, and then you can go home healthy or 
with a young child or whatever you wished for. Yeah, so that is Satonda. We leave Satonda and set our course for Lombok, the last island we'll be visiting on our voyage to the Lesser Sunda Islands. During our cruise, we visited idyllic landscapes, discovered different cultures, different traditions. Tana Arikita, our land and our water, is what Indonesians call their own country. We've hardly scratched the surface of the land, but in each island, as well as on board the Ombak Puti, we have been able to appreciate the importance and respect these people attribute to the sea. I'm very happy to be working on a boat. People like me. I'm known as a nice guy. I play guitar. And I never get angry. I used to work in Jakarta, a year working in a discotheque. Then I worked on a cargo boat, a pinisi, like this one, for a boogie skipper. I stayed on for seven years. We did regular runs between Jakarta and Kalimantan or Jakarta and Siraban or Saramang. But when I came into port, I would go out and act like a hooligan. And then I met Captain Abdi, and I've been working for him ever since. It's been 10 years now, at first on another Penisi, the Katerina, and now on this one. I'm not afraid of big waves. They can sometimes reach six or seven meters, even nine meters. But I'm not afraid. I'm used to it. I'm like a dolphin. That's right, a dolphin. Even if a 10 meter wave washes me overboard, I can swim to shore. I'm like my ancestors who always lived on the sea. Even when a boat would sink, they could survive for a week. That's how they were, my ancestors. It's still night as we come into the harbor of Kayangan on Lombok. The prows with their outriggers and the boogie fishing boats pass the ferries heading for Sumbawa.
For the last time, we drop anchor off what looks like a tropical paradise. But there is the shadow of the Rinjani volcano looming over it. We leave the shore and head toward the interior of the island. The volcano, just as deadly as it is sacred, has showered the surrounding land with its ashes, a manna of natural fertilizer. During this day, we visited a number of villages, and everywhere we discovered, as in our previous ports of call, a young, dynamic population attached to their traditions. The Lesser Sunda Islands have managed to make a happy marriage of the different religious and cultural influences accumulated over the long centuries of their history. Lombok, nicknamed Pepper Island by the inhabitants, owes its spicy character and diversity as much to the Muslim Sasak majority as to the Hinduist Balinese minority. This ethnic mix is reflected not only in the faces of these women doing their weaving or pottery, it can also be found in certain traditions. One of them, of Buddhist influence, consists in giving out rice at marriages and funerals. Situated on the sea routes to the Spice Islands, the Lesser Sunda Islands have often changed rulers. Down through the long centuries of their turbulent history, these islands have managed to preserve their traditions, while at the same time enriching their culture with outside influences. Today, it's music and dance that best express this cultural fusion that has made the riches of the Lesser Sunda Islands.